Washington Network's Saturday Action Rally. We're coming to you live on WLIB, 1190 AM in New York. We're streaming to you across the country on a number of platforms, including Facebook, uh, um, including Facebook, nationalactionnetwork.net, and uh, YouTube, among others. We are here live in the House of Justice, 106 West 145th Street. You want to call somebody, tell them the action is on the air. The Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton is in the house and getting ready to come to you. We're so pleased that you have joined us on this Saturday morning because if it's Saturday and you hear the cry of no justice, no peace, you know this is where the action is. Our president and founder is the Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton. Chairman of our board is the Reverend Dr. W. Franklin Richardson, senior pastor of Grace Baptist Church in Mount Vernon, New York. I'm attorney Michael Hardy. We'll be with you throughout the broadcast this morning. We are so pleased to have with us today for our inspirational word segment, the Reverend Janice Green, pastor of Merrick Park Baptist Church in the great village of Jamaica, New York. Of course, it's Women's History Month, and so we'll be getting special presentations throughout the month from the Women's Auxiliary on Women's History. If it's Saturday, our musical director is in the house. Tyrone Richardson is traveling today. So we have the one and only Bavon Neal sitting in today as our musical director, the author of Your Change Will Come. Happy to have him here this morning. Of course, it's a bit Saturday. Our dear sister, Nancy Darling Crawford, will be here to ask you what's on your mind. That's right. Come on. There's so much going on around the world, probably in your own home. There must be something that you're thinking about that's on your mind, and you can share it with Sister Crawford. If you've not had an opportunity to do so yet, you can still do so. You can call 877-626-4651, or you can email what's on your mind at nationalactionnetwork.net, and it'll all get to Sister Darlene so she can share it with us. Once again, our president is in the house, so you want to call somebody. You want to tell them the action is on the air. The Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton is in the house and getting ready to come to you. Brothers and sisters, we first want to thank everyone and all of the attorneys that participated in Legal Night. We're so grateful for everyone that participated. And we want to especially thank the Honorable Justice J. Michelle Sweeting, who gave a very special Black History Month and Women's History Month uh, 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 discussion on the great late Constant Baker Motley. We really want to thank the judge for being with us last night and all of you that was in attendance. Really appreciate it. Also want to remind you that the NAN Youth Huddle will meet on Monday, March 4th, right here at the House of Justice Auditorium. You want to spread the word and get into the action with our youngest and brightest dreamers of today and leaders of tomorrow. For more information on the Youth Huddle, you can call 877-626-4651 or email NAN youthhuddle at gmail.com. All right, today is Saturday. Tomorrow is Sunday. Today, Saturday at 5 p.m. 
tomorrow Sunday at 5 p.m. You want to make sure that you are tuning in to MSNBC's Politics Nation. That's today and tomorrow at 5 p.m. Saturday and Sunday. Tune in to MSNBC's Politics Nation. Right now, brothers and sisters, our dear sister, Jay Spencer Lear, will come and give us some additional announcements. Thank you. Good morning. And thank you for tuning in to another Saturday Action Rally with National Action Network. And thank you for being here in the House of Justice. Here is some information to keep you in the know. Rev Sharpton on the world stage. In the early part of this week, Rev Sharpton was across the pond in the UK for a multitude of speaking engagements. He led a special presentation and talk back at Homerton College, University of Cambridge, with Lord Simon Woolley and students where he discussed his trip to the region 33 years ago when activists asked him for help getting justice for Roland Adams, killed by a white mob. Rev Sharpton highlighted how Roland Adams' aunt is now a member of the House of the Lords in the UK Parliament. National Action Network's fierce leader also spoke at the 2024 National Church Leaders Forum in London about black church political mobilization. He discussed Dr. King's legacy and the black church, the pivotal role of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and the importance of the church as a basis of gathering for the liberation struggle. At another event at Cambridge Union, Rev Sharpton delivered powerful opening remarks. He spoke of the seriousness of the moment and how the world will have to decide whether they proceed with autocracy or preserve democracy. In the midst of all these major speeches, Nan's founder also delivered opening remarks for a presentation at Oxford Union where he met with students for a private Q&A beforehand and also participated in a fireside chat. In addition to these appearances, Rev Sharpton also sat down for an interview with Sky News and penned an op-ed for The Guardian about rising racism in both the US and the UK and the power of the black vote to stop it. Invocation for Yousef Salam. Back in the States, Rev Sharpton delivered a stirring invocation for exonerated five-member Yousef Salam, now a member of the New York City Council. He reminded everyone that no matter what they do to you, you can still rise like a phoenix if you hold on and if you stand tall. Yusuf Salam is a symbol for everyone, said Rev Sharpton. Rev Sharpton praised Yusuf's mother and said that he was honored to stand with Yusuf and fight for justice for the exonerated five. Decades ago, and through the years leading up to this momentous occasion. Protesting for DEI, Rev Sharpton, National Action Network, and supporters continued their ongoing protests on Thursday outside of Bill Ackman's Manhattan office. For the ninth week in a row, the demonstration against Ackman and the push for the preservation of diversity, equity, and inclusion programs has garnered attention from a broad spectrum of folks yeah. who stand in solidarity with NAN every week. Right. The hedge fund billionaire Ackman 
orchestrated a vicious smear campaign against former Harvard president Claudine Gay and has continuously attacked DEI. Each and every Thursday, protesters from all backgrounds join NAN as they chant in unison. When is DEI under attack? What do we do? Stand up, fight back. What do we do? Stand up, fight back. And what do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now. The strong show of support stands in stark contrast to Axman's attempts to regress society. Rev Sharpton and Nan vowed to continue the weekly protest until DEI is protected in the workplace, in academia, and everywhere. Last weekend, Rev Sharpton attended the 2024 Great American Emancipation Day Awards celebration in Newark, New Jersey, where he received the prestigious Leadership Award. The event was organized by Positive Community, the only faith-based lifestyle magazine targeted to the African-American market in the NYU NJ area, focused on good news from the church and the community. Rev Sharpton gave a rousing acceptance speech where he discussed the importance of unity, speaking for ourselves and staying connected to the community regardless of what you achieve or where you excel in life. No matter where I go, where I be, I know where I started, said Rev Sharpton. Welcome to all of you who have tuned in and joined us also via live stream at www.nationalactionnetwork.net and also live on Facebook at National Action Network. If this is your first time joining us and or if you are not a member of NAN, we welcome you to join NAN and invite you to join us and get into the action today. For more information and to join, you may visit www.nationalactionnetwork.net. Call 877-626-4651 and share this with your friends and your coworkers. Or text the word NAN to 59769. Welcome. Thank you. All right, Sister Jay, I want to thank you for that version this morning from the announcement. Right now, brothers and sisters, Nancy Darling Crawford is here to ask you what's on your mind. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome to another weekly segment of What's on Your Mind, where you, the community and membership base, engage with the National Action Network by sharing with us What's on your mind? And before we start, I just want to wish all of the women all over the world a very happy Women's History Month. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Give us your name and briefly share one thought of what's on your mind. Good morning, Nan family. My name is Joe Gonzalez, and I'm from Brooklyn, New York. And what's on my mind is this congestion pricing fiasco that is about to ravish the bank accounts of poor and working class people. For the uninformed, state law was changed about three years ago, which gives the MTA the authority to charge people who drive into certain parts of New York City. Not one elected official has come into NAN to engage NAN membership about this issue. I, I don't understand how NAN members and the larger community can be affected and of all the electeds who come in here, not one has discussed this with us. So what I'd like to uh, say going forward is that when state legislators are contemplating passing laws that affect the membership, that they come in and discuss it with us. N a congestion pricing is one of just a number of things that have happened and not one and many, many electeds come here to discuss things. 
NYCHA has been privatized. State law was changed. State legislators come in here, do not engage NAN members, and they pass a law that affects us. So going forward, I conclude by saying that whenever elected officials come in here, they must discuss with us the issues that affect the membership. And that's what's on my mind. All right. Thank you, my brother. Thank you so much for sharing. Good morning. Give us your name and briefly share one thought of what's on your mind. Good morning. My name is Brenda Ricketts, and I'm from Yonkers. What's on my mind is this past week, I learned the truth in Galatians 6, 9, that says we should not grow weary from doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. This week I received a call from a man whose ancestors owned my ancestors. I am a genealogist and my family historian Nearly all of my 76 years, I am a member of the African American Historical and Genealogical Society, and I thank God that I live to see this moment. We as a people should never, ever give up. Yes, thank you so much for sharing that, my sister. Good morning. Give us your name and briefly share one thought of what's on your mind. Good day, everybody, and God bless everybody. My name is Sister Raven Word. I'm from Heaven, born in Harlem. I'm 72 years old and new, and I'm National Action Network Lifetime member. Of course, what's on my mind is Bible scriptures. In particular, Christ Jesus particularly chose a woman first to preach and teach the gospel that he is risen. So this is a real, clear, true fact that women need to take leadership roles whenever possible. And I respectfully suggest that women take the leadership role to vote democracy in. Please encourage every person who's in your family, dear women, to let them know we need democracy very, very much to also protect women's rights, but everybody's rights. God bless you. Good day. Good day. Thank you so much, my sister. Good morning. Give us your name and briefly share one thought of what's on your mind. My name is Ingrid and I'm from Brooklyn. What's on my mind is the Supreme Court. We as American, we need to start holding the Supreme Court accountable. When they are getting paid from us, they, we don't work, they don't work for, we work for, they work for us, I'm sorry. They work for us. We're supposed to be able to know that they are doing their job. You know the Supreme Court get over 7,000 cases a year and they only do under, under 100 cases. You gotta ask yourself, what are they doing with our money? And why are they getting paid for lacking off? If that was us, we wouldn't be able to be on our jobs, doing our jobs for as long as we are. And I wanna say to the American people, start holding them accountable, and also, I want our black people who, and brown people who are incarcerated, we want the Donald Trump treatment. Our people should not be incarcerated and being held. I met a young lady over the summer, and she spoke to me, and she was telling me her story. She, she end up, uh, had an altercation with someone, and she ended up in jail. She met a lady that stole a snicker bar when she was 18 years old. Now the lady is 50-something years old. That is unfair, it's unjust, and we got to hold the Supreme Court we need to know what they're doing. Somebody needs to start investigating them. Thank you. Thank you, my sister. Thank you for sharing. Give us your name and briefly share one thought of what's on your mind. I'm Minister Sandra out of the Bronx in New York. And what's on my mind is I was watching Channel 5, um, The Street Soldier with Lisa Evans. And they were talking about the medical, the DEI also and whoever the doctor was on there. That's what's on my mind. She, they come on from 10.30, she comes on from 10.30 to 11 o'clock, only a half an hour. And then even, it's not even a half an hour, it's 15 minutes of it because of the commercials. Okay, thank you my sister. Good morning my brother. Give us your name and briefly share one thought of what's on your mind. I'm Dr. Frank Douglas from Basking Ridge, New Jersey. And what's on my mind is the fact that 
many of our brothers and sisters are in companies and studying in universities where the principles of affirmative action and DEI are no longer being upheld. As a matter of fact, in Florida, all of the universities have eliminated their DEI programs. It brings to mind the case of Dr. Antoine, Antoinette Candia Bailey, who was Vice President of Student Affairs at Lincoln University, and prior to that was Chief Diversity Officer at Elms College. This dear, brilliant sister committed suicide on January 8, although she had written many emails talking about how she was being treated by the, the president of the university. I want to express my gratitude to the Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton for putting the spotlight and all of the efforts on this issue. I also want to express my gratitude to many of the colleagues here who have been supporting me in launching a committee and who have been giving me guidance. And finally, I'd like to thank the leaders of the chapter who approved my proposal for the committee in a very rapid time frame. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Good morning, give us your name and briefly share one thought of what's on your mind. Good morning, National Action Network. I'm Jesse Fields, Dr. Jesse Fields, medical doctor here in, in Harlem. And what's on my mind this morning, going from Black History Month to Women's History Month, uh, and continuing, as Reverend Sharpton always says, continuing to celebrate black history throughout the year, not just in February, and women's history and black women's history. Who's on my mind is Fannie Lou Hamer. I have a book that has a, written by Lorraine Hansberry, uh, uh, and it has information about Fannie Lou Hamer. She was a remarkable woman. She faced severe discrimination. She was beaten. She was tortured. She had what she called, and many called, the Mississippi appendectomy, which was the forced, unconsented to hysterectomy on black women that was done uh, for, for many, many years, and other discrimination. She testified, as we know, August 22, 1964, she was pivotal in founding the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. She gave a very moving testimony. Um, and even though she suffered, she faced discrimination, she never stopped speaking, she never stopped fighting, she never stopped singing. She's in the spirit of no justice, no peace. National Action Network will celebrate all these women leaders through this month and forever. Thank you. No justice, no peace. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning, my sister. Give us your name and briefly share one thought of what's on your mind. Yes. Good morning. My name is Savannah Bailey McLean. I'm the executive director of the West Harlem Art Fund. And what's on my mind is climate change and how it impacts the black and brown community. Ever since the pandemic, we have seen how public spaces, park spaces are really pivotal for our mental health as well as our well-being. But Nonetheless, our park spaces in our communities are neglected. They don't have the proper personnel who are trained. They don't get the resources. Right now, there's a moratorium where you cannot create gardens in New York City parks because they don't have the personnel to do it. I'm engaging in a large scale project in Harlem. It will be the largest outdoor public sculpture exhibition in Harlem's history, but yet, we need help to fix the parks to present. So I'm asking the National Action Network to work with my organization and others so that we can make this an annual thing, not just beautify, but make sure that our mental health and our well-being is safeguarded. That's what's on my mind. Well, thank you so much for sharing that very important information. Thank you. That concludes this week's segment of What's On Your Mind. Please be reminded that the viewpoints heard here today are simply those of the contributors and do not reflect those of National Action Network. And if you would like to engage with us by sharing what's on your mind, please do so by emailing what's on your mind at nationalactionnetwork.net or you may call us directly at 877 626 Four six five one. Back to you, Attorney Harding. All right, and thank you so much.
for this week's What's On Your Mind. Right now, brothers and sisters, our Nan Change Choir soloist, Tisha Hunter.
that is Tisha Hunter, our Nan Change Choir soloist, all under the direction today of Bavon Neal, sitting in for our musical director, along with the Nan Change Band. Right now, brothers and sisters, of course, it is Women's History Month, and each week of the month, the Women's Auxiliary of the New York City Chapter will have a special presentation to tell us all about the month and to bring us our special guest for today is Lisa Goldie Hops, the president of the New York City Chapter of the Women's Auxiliary. Let's welcome her. Thank you, Attorney Hardy. Greetings and good morning. The Women Auxiliary of National Action Network are in the house and on the move, connecting, supporting, uplifting, the moving, and our cause, activating women on the ground to be engaged and involved in the change we wish to see. The Women Auxiliary of National Action Network, New York City Chapter, is an active component of the National Action Network leading civil rights organization under the leadership of Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton. We organize to energize in the city to show up, be involved, have a voice. We support the chapter and leaderships in ways that works to sustain the networks and its ground. And we work to connect and empower the next generation for success. We do these things through various activities through our, that are bursting through the organization. Whether it's giving away our annual holiday baskets to family in needs during the holiday season, having forms for the community that address our concerns around health care, family preservation, mental health, voting registration, and financial empowerment, honoring community leaders at our annual 26th annual Women of Excellent Man of Vision Award, which will be held at National Action Network at 106 West 145th Street in the village of Harlem. On March 30th, 2024, from 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. For tickets, you can see me. We also give out youth scholarship for colleges through the Kathy Jordan Scholarship Fund. The Women Auxiliary of the National Action Networks are committed and work daily to empower communities and nurture the next generation for success. Today, the Women Auxiliary will be hosting a mental health awareness forum at the House of Justice, located at 106, West 145th Street in the village of Harlem. The mental health forum will be from 12.30 to 2 p.m. We invite you to join and support the Women Auxiliary and help lift our women up. Women who have been the, the movement pillar for many generations. We meet every first Saturday of the month immediately following the Saturday Action Rally. For more information on how to join us, please call 877-626 Four six five one. Today, the woman auxiliary is wearing shades of blue, often symbolize stability, health, wisdom, and inspiration. Today, our guest speaker, Kathleen Trigger Jones, is an Emmy Award winning journalist, producer, actress, marketing, and media strategist who is on a mission to leave an incredible mark on the world. Kathleen Media Power West extends to her role of executive producer of hosting the Telly Award winning I Women Report, I Women TV, talk show, Chit Chat, and the doc series, We Are the Joneses, which she created, executive produced, and starred in. Beyond the silver screen, Kathleen is the trailblazer, executive who has found and led three groundbreaking media companies. I Women TV, Capscape Production, and Trigger Globe Media. In 2006, Kathleen filed her nonprofit organization, The Trig House, which, which support young women aging out of foster care. Recognizing the deeds for energetic nonprofit in the area, she became a New York State court appointed special advocate for foster children and is currently working on a plan to launch the film, first film. Academy in New York dedicated to housing. Uh, whew, whew, mentoring and training at-risk youth 
young women for the jobs in television and film. Her philanthropy work are deeply personal rooted in her own humble beginnings of starting like an orphaning, orphan and spending her first two years in foster care. It was these early experiences that led her on the journey of a self-discovery fuel, her desire to dedicate her life to changing the world for women and girls. I present to you Kathleen Trigger Jones. Ah, good morning, family. How's everyone doing this morning? Ah, it's, you know, the little rain can't stop our parade, can it? Absolutely not. Thank you so much, Goldie, for that beautiful introduction. I am Kathleen Trigg Jones. It is, an, it is an absolute pleasure and honor to be here. I'm going to say in the house of the Lord because we know, we know who's guiding us this morning. We know who woke us up this morning. Where two or more are gathered, what? Thank you. Okay. All right. It is an absolute honor uh, to be here this morning. I want to thank the incredible, world-renowned Miss Kathy Jordan Sharpton, who's in the house here, for having the vision and keeping this legacy of the Women's Auxiliary alive for so many years. It's the gift that just keeps giving. And to your beautiful offspring here in the room, the world-renowned change makers, <laughs> event planners, talk show host, Dominique and Ashley, I see you. I love you. God bless you. And keep continuing to make us proud queens. And can we give it up to the Reverend, the legendary Reverend Al Sharpton? who in just a few minutes today will be blessing you with his presence. Um, I'm real clear today, without him, there may be no us. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Because from the time I've been on this earth, the National Action Network and Reverend Al has been standing up for us, fighting for us, fighting for our rights, and we must keep our crowns on, hold this torch up high that he's passing down to us, and continue to carry on this legacy. Our rights depend on it. Our legacy depends on it. Our race depends on it. We must continue to carry the torch. So. I've been really blessed my whole life, I have to say. I, I'm a child of God, and I feel extremely blessed um, to have accomplished every goal, for the most part, that I've set for myself. And I don't say that from a place of bragging. I say that from a place of extreme humility and gratitude to God for seeing something in me, someone that I'm not so sure was supposed to be successful, was supposed to reach the heights that I reached. Um, let me reverse that a little bit. I was born a child of God, so I was absolutely destined for the greatness that I achieved in life. We all are. I just didn't know it, and the people around me didn't necessarily know it. But when I really look at the accomplishments, and thank you, Goldie, for, for pointing them out to me, because sometimes we, as, as black people, as women, sometimes we want to just stay small, and we don't really want anyone to talk about us. We're a little, we get a little embarrassed, like, oh, you know, don't say that. But the reality is that when I look at where I came from and I look at the achievements that I've had in my life, I can't thank God enough because it's only through the grace of God that I, a little child who came from an orphanage, no one wanted because I was black, because of the color of my skin, that I could go on to win an Emmy Award, be nominated for several awards, win, win a Telly Award. <laughs> and I just won an, an Anthem Award just won an Anthem Award for my social justice work, helping young women aging out of foster care. These are not my awards. These are the awards of a, a true child who has followed the course that God set for me. My dream since I was a little girl was to be on television. Since I was seven years old, I told everyone, I'm going to live in New York City. I grew up in Dover, Delaware, far from New York. I'm going to live in New York City. I'm going to be on television. I didn't know how I was going to get there, but I was very clear. No one really believed in that dream but me, myself, and God. Because how could someone who was left at an orphanage when they were a baby, 
how could I, someone who started out in foster care and was adopted just before my, my, my second birthday, how could I achieve this greatness? It's just impossible. So no one believed it but me, but I knew for certain that this was my destiny. I knew I was going to live in New York. I knew I was going to be on television. And I didn't let anyone stand in the way of that dream because I knew I had a purpose. I had a calling that was greater than me. I was born six days after Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968 in Dayton, Ohio, to a white mother and a black father. So you can do the math, you can add that up. It wasn't appropriate for a white woman to bring home this black child. My father was in jail at the time, and his family, his black family, his black mother, it's not that they didn't want me, but they couldn't afford to raise me, and they did not want to see me raised by the poor white family that I was born into because of the racial uh, injustices they feared would, would take place in my life. So I was dropped off at an orphanage. But one family's trash was another family's treasure. Thank you for that. I was adopted just before my second birthday to my angels that arrived, a, a, a Southern Baptist, devout Christian, strict mother, kept me on a straight and narrow and a military dad in Dover, Delaware. I couldn't do anything but eat, pray, and dream, and I dreamed a lot. Let me tell you something. You know, it's all in, in just that I'm able to stand here and, and joke a little bit about it, but life wasn't easy. Life's not been easy, but let me tell you, I stayed the course. I continued to follow my passion and my dreams, and now I continue to advocate and fight for women and young girls all over the world. I don't know what my life would have been, but my mother committed suicide. My birth mother committed suicide. My, my two white sisters, who she did keep in the family, have struggled with mental health issues and medical problems and a lot of, a lot of death and destruction in their family. My father had 22 other children, I just found out. Just met him recently, my black dad. I actually have a relationship with him now. Um, I don't know what my life would have been, but I do know by seeing the young women that I helped that stayed in foster care that I don't believe I would have had the opportunities that God has afforded me. Let me tell you something. My time here with you today is limited, but I founded my own television network called iWoman TV because black women, women in general, are still struggling. The struggle is real. We're not there yet. Black people are still struggling. We have a great amount of work to do. And thank God for the National Action Network. Thank God for my network, iWoman TV. I ask you all to please continue to lift one another up. Follow me, follow iWoman TV, iWoman.tv. Show me some love. I am on a mission to change the world for women and girls by changing the trajectory, changing the stories, changing the narrative of how we are portrayed on television and in film. God bless you all. Thank you for being change makers. The fact that, the mere fact that you showed up this morning shows me that you are all impact investors. Typically an impact investor is someone who's giving millions of dollars to help the next generation, but your time is priceless and you could be anywhere today, but you chose to be here. God bless you all and thank you for keeping the dream of life. Happy Women's History Month. Yeah. All right. I want to thank you. I want to thank you so much for the Women's Month National Action Network's Women's Auxiliary History Month presentation under the direction of our musical director today, Vivon Neal, the Change Ensemble. Yeah. Right, Jesus is real. Jesus is real. I know the Lord is real to me. Oh, yes, he's real to me. Sing, Jesus is real. Yeah. I know the Lord is Sometimes when I'm feeling low, nowhere to go, Jesus comes along and makes me strong.
Under the direction of our musical director, Bob on Neil. Right now, brothers and sisters, it is indeed our honor and privilege this morning to have for our inspirational word the Reverend Janice Green. She's the pastor of Merrick Park Baptist Church from the village of Jamaica, New York. Amen. Can we give the Lord a praise this Saturday morning? Come on, don't do it for me. Is it anybody excited to still be alive? Still excited to be in your right mind? You was able to come in here on your own, and if you wasn't, you had a little assistance. Thanks be unto God that you are still here. Come on, can we open up our mouths and give God what's due him? Because I don't deserve it, but he's still good. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm excited to be here this Saturday because the Lord is good to me. And I'm looking at a people, he's been good to you. Amen. And we are here this morning to come together to not only look at one another, but to give God what's due him. Serving each other is doing God's work. Amen. How many of you know it's not just about you? Look at your neighbor and say, it's not just about you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> we give honor to our founder and president, Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton. Amen. We pray God's continued blessings on him. We are here today because of him. I've been um, following and listening to him my whole life, especially growing up in Pleasant Grove Tabernacle. Amen. Under the leadership of Bishop Jameson, of him being at all of our tent services, and, and he's a preacher extraordinaire. Amen. So we thank God for him today. We thank God also for the chairman of the board, Dr. W. Franklin Richardson. Amen. Amen. We thank God for him. If you can, if you could turn with me to Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. I'm happy to be here opening up for Women's History Month. Yeah. Is it any woman happy that you're a woman? Yeah. <laughs> I love everything about it. Right. Amen. I love my hips, my curves, my skin, my smell. Some, I need a lady to shout, I am a woman. <laughs> Amen. Re Revelation chapter 12, verse 11 I will only be reading the A clause for your hearing. When you have it, say, I have it. I have it. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. I want to put that in your hearing one more time. And they overcame him. Somebody shall overcame him. By the blood of the lamb. And the word of their testimony. I want to talk to you for a couple of moments on the subject. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. 
The scripture in Revelation chapter 12, it opens up with a war in heaven. There is a catastrophe. There is chaos. There is a fight happening in heaven. I know I may be contradicting myself because when you think of heaven, you don't think of a fight. When you think of heaven, you think of peace. You think of joy. You think of happiness. You think of where your ancestors are. You think of that's where my grandma is. That's where my nana is. That's where big ma is. You think of a place of rest. But I'm here to tell you that there was a war happening in heaven. Uh, just like in heaven, the scripture says, like on heaven, uh, it is also in earth. So if there was a fight in heaven, there's a, a possibility that there is a fight here on earth. Uh, I don't know about you, but I am uh, very cognizant on the fact that the fight still continues. Uh, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, the fight still continues. Uh huh. And so from verse 1 up until verse 10, there is a very descriptive uh, uh, plot and narrative and setting that is going on in heaven that describes the war that is happening between the enemy and the people of God. There is a description of a fight that is happening between uh, the enemy and the people that just want to have peace. But you know, like I know, if there's no justice, watch it, uh, there is uh, no peace. Uh, and so now because there's no peace and our uh, uh, existence has been disrupted and has been messed up, uh, we find ourselves in verse 11. Uh, verse 11 is our place of victory. Verse 11 is our place of winning. Uh, verse 11 is our place of accomplishment uh, because it says we shall overcome him. Who is him? I, I'm glad that you asked. You said Janice. Uh, who is him? Him uh, is the enemy, but the acronym uh, that I have for the enemy in this particular text uh, is what they have used uh, uh, as systematic racism uh, to keep us separate and to keep us under. H represents health care. We as a People do not receive in our communities, in our area, the same uh, top-notch health cares as our brothers and our sisters uh, of other cultures. Uh, we are the last to be diagnosed for diabetes and hypertension and of various cancers. Uh, we are still fighting for health care. Somebody shall health care. Uh, I represents institutionalism. Uh, we are still fighting uh, to not be number one on the chart in jail. Uh, we are still giving the highest uh, and the most cruelest uh, uh, sentences of mankind. Uh, there is still a fight in our institution. Uh, M represents money. Uh, we are fighting even in economics. Uh, we're fighting to be alive, we're fighting to be free, and we're fighting to have money. Can I talk to somebody today? Oh, but the scripture is very clear. We can overcome him by what? The blood of the lamb. I wish I had somebody that still believed in the blood. I know we're fighting, but if it had not been for the blood, I wish I had somebody that was a witness. Oh, what can wash away my soul? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, nothing but the blood. Oh, Jesus, over 2,000 years ago, a black man that was wrongfully judged innocent didn't do nothing. All he did was heal people, feed 5,000, not including women and children. But he still found himself on the cross. He still found himself being crucified. But by his sacrifice uh, we shall overcome uh, not only do we overcome by the blood of Jesus uh, but we overcome because our ancestors uh, shed their blood so we can vote uh, they shed their blood so we can have a voice oh God
have a voice today to talk about how we can overcome. Uh, but not only do we overcome by the blood, uh, but I overcome because I got a testimony. Uh, I want somebody to look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, oh, I got a testimony. Uh, I know I look good. I know I look great today, uh, but I got a testimony. Uh, the reason how our young people are going to make it uh, is if you tell your testimony. Uh, look at your neighbor and say, we shall, uh, we shall overcome. Uh, I need you to look at a neighbor that believe it and know that it's going to happen. Uh, look at somebody else and say, I don't care what you're going through. Uh, we shall overcome. All right, we want to thank Reverend Janice Green, Pastor Merrick Park Baptist Church in Jamaica, New York. Right now, brothers and sisters, I want you to get on your feet right now because we're going to bring to you the president and founder of the National Action Network, the Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton. No justice, no justice, no justice, no justice. What do we want? What do we want? What do we want? When do we want it? 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 Fist bump the person next to you, tell them you love them. Never give in, a change will come, keep faith down with it. Troubles and trials won't last always, with God on our side, nothing but quiet again. Hold on, be strong, a better day is coming and it won't be too long. celebrate Women's History Month, I'm mindful of it was women in the black community that had to bear the burden of trying to express and enhance and empower their womanhood, but at the same time had to make men out of boys. Because black men had been reduced to nothing, black women had to compensate for their being broken down and had to rebuild them as they built themselves. And sometimes black men who never would speak back to the master or to those that oppressed and exploited them would take their pain out on black women. And we tried to justify it 
saying, well, that's just the way he is. Well, no, that's the way we let him be. But black women put us on their backs and brought us across the victory line of slavery. It was a black woman. It was a black woman that sat down in the front of the bus while three black men sat in the back talking about why is she causing trouble. But black women always knew if you kept on fighting, if you kept on standing up, your change will come. Your change will come. Your change will come. Just hang on in there. Your change will come. Your change will come. Oh, change will come. They write stories about our journeys. Esquire did this big piece on me this month, but the thing that is always something striking to me is they talk about the men that influenced me growing up, and I've been blessed to have great men pour into me. But one woman that was outstanding other than my mother was a woman in Brooklyn called Shirley Chisholm. Shirley Chisholm in 1968, when I was 13 years old, I met her. And she was running for Congress. What people don't talk about, Shirley Chisholm beat James Farmer, who was the head of CORE. And I remember when James Farmer came to Brooklyn, it was a big deal because he had been the head of one of the big six organizations. And nobody thought this woman, Shirley Chisholm, assembly woman, could beat James Farmer. Richard Nixon was the head of James Farmer's ticket. James Farmer was a Republican. And they poured money in the bed -Stuy. But Shirley Chisholm said, I'm unbought and I'm unbossed. And she hit the street corners and got megaphones and got the vote out. And halfway through the campaign, even though my church was with James Farmer, <clears throat> Shirley got me out there with her. And she helped to mold and shape many, I rode many days with her and became close with her. And one of the things that have followed me throughout my career is every time I'm sitting in a CEO's office at a corporation trying to negotiate a breakthrough for black business, every time I'm sitting in the White House trying to get some legislation, every time I'm dealing with a big shot anyway, I can hear Shirley telling me we're unbought and unbossed yes, yes, yes. and I believe if we keep standing up and live up to Shirley's mandate our change will come your change, your change will come the change don't you give up the change National Action Network Change Choir, give them a big hand. Give them a big hand. Certainly we're happy to be with you another Saturday morning for the Saturday Action Rally for you that are here live in the House of Justice, 106 West 145th Street in the village of Harlem. And for you that are listening live on 1190 WLIB AM in New York and you that are watching on various media platforms around the country and even other parts of the world, we're happy to be with you another Saturday morning to give our report on where the action is. Let's welcome people watching us on Impact Television. 
Let's give a hand to our presider, Attorney Michael Hardy. Our musical director today, one of the legendary artists who wrote the song, I'll Change Your Come, Brevon Neal. And give Chris and the band some. Then we enjoy our inspirational word, Reverend Janice Green. And certainly we honor all of our women on Women's History Month, our women auxiliary here in the National Action Network. And all of the work that they do since we started the organization 33 years ago. Glad to recognize some of our women, the mother of Eric Gardner. Give a hand, Gwen Carr in the house. And I certainly take note. I really was uh, very attentive. You know, I've been speaking since I was a kid, and you got to be good to get my attention. But I really perked up. I told them in the back, be quiet, I want to hear this. The more she talked, the more I listened to Kathleen Trick Jones. Give her a hand. That's a great, great journey, great story that she told. Because some, some of y'all see folk on television and don't know the story. And y'all think that everybody, because they are refined, you don't know how they were defined. And a lot of us may look to you a certain way, but you don't understand how we got there. You know, I, I, I often tell young people when I'm lecturing places, that one of the most degrading things, I thought about it when I was listening to Kathleen, one of the most degrading things that I've seen happen to black folks is self-degradation. Yes. Wow. When uh, Dominique went to college at Temple in Philly and uh, they were telling the kid, the black kids in Temple that if you speak eloquently like Kathleen or if you act in a certain proper way, you act in white. They actually was giving young people complexes for speaking properly and acting properly. You act in white. Which the inference is that if you talking like a hoodlum and acting like a thug, that's what black folks are. And that is degrading you and making you celebrate their degradation. And I think that it is important that we know that our striving in this journey in this country has been to strive toward excellence because that's who we are. We were brought here and brought down. We were not down before we got here. And to adopt a slave mentality does not make you black, it makes you a slave. Even if you're enslaved, you ought to think free till you get free. I was telling somebody the other day, they said, well, you start preaching when you was four. How did you start preaching? I said, I started at three. So what do you mean you started three? I said, I started preaching to my sister's dolls. <laughs> I didn't know I was practicing. <laughs> and when I heard her story, it made me think all of us got a story. Now, some of y'all done got wherever and don't want to tell your story. But I think there is affirmation, self-affirmation in telling your story. Don't hide where you've been. I tell reporters that all the time. You don't have to dig up my mess. I'll tell you my mess. I know some, me I know some mess I did that you'll never figure out.
Because my story is not in my mess. My story is that I survived my mess and made it anyhow. If you ain't never been through nothing, you are not going to get through nothing. You know, I don't like folks never been through nothing. Folk be coming in now, you know, that we all got established and people be handing Hardy and them the resumes and now we got Reverend Bird head of operations and all that. And they be handing them the resume and Bird come in my office and give me uh, I've interviewed these three people, and this one looks good, and that one, da-da-da-da, and this one went to the right places and have all the references and never made a mistake and got everybody on his side. <laughs> and I look at the resume and say, all right. But I don't like folk that's too perfect. You sure can't travel with me if you're too perfect. Because if you ain't never been through nothing, you hang out with me, we liable to get through something. And if you ain't never been through nothing, I don't know if you can get through something. I like to hang out with folks that been knocked down and dragged through the mud and discounted and discarded. And nobody saw no potential in them, but somehow they broke through anyhow. That's the kind of folk I like to be around. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I tell the story all the time when I was running for president in 2004. We had debates, and I remember we, one night we debated in uh, Detroit at the... Uh, theater down to Fox Theater. And uh, I remember when we was coming off the stage, they always have the group of media that you'd go in and talk to the media because part of the whole game with running for president, the political game, is you trying to sell your candidacy. So you do your best on the debate stage, but then whatever you trying to do, you get up in uh, around the press corps and then you try to sell that you did good if, even if you didn't. And uh, I remember one reporter in the, in the gag said, you know, Reverend Al, you did good tonight. I said, thank you. He said, no, I think you won the debate. I said, well, thank you. He said, and you ought to be proud to be up there. And I turned, I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, no, you up there debating senators and governors, you know, Lieberman, Senator Lieberman was in the race, Senator Edwards and Senator Kerry and Governor Graham of Florida, all of them and me. He said, you ought to be good. They come from, you know, backgrounds of political power, two or three generations and business, two or three generations. And you didn't come from that yet. You, you beat them in a debate. I said, well, first of all, you need to understand that they was born on third base. Wow. And think they hit a triple. I, I wasn't even born in the stadium. I had to come through the parking lot, down through the bleachers, then down through the stands, and then hit a triple. But we all on the same stage now. So since I had to come through more, that must mean I'm tougher than them and stronger than them and smarter than them. Because if they had to come through what I came through, they may not have been on that stage. So don't ever deny what you've been through because the fact that you've been through it meant you more equipped to handle the way you are. I go downtown every, you know, today and tomorrow I'm on live 5 o'clock, MSNBC, my show. I am walking 30 Rockefeller Center. Ain't nobody in the building been through what I've been through. Which is why I take seriously what I'm doing. I wasn't supposed to be at 30 Rock. She wasn't supposed to be on television. That's why when we get on, we can outdo those that thought they were entitled to it. So I'm glad that our Women's Month kicked off right. Let me thank uh, those of you, of you, first of all, that continued the picketing at Bill Ackman's office. Yeah. 
This is the eighth week and our ninth week, I'm sorry. And our uh, group has been out. Bill Ackman has been one of the leading proponents to end diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, I thank uh, Minister Ron McHenry, who leads us every week. <laughs> Brother Christian, who assists him. It is important in persistence. Persistence is important. Let me tell you something. People that were going to do business certain ways change their business because you're all out there picking it. He ran a slate for the board of Harvard University after they had dismissed or forced the resignation of Dr. Claudine Gay. And his whole slate was defeated. One of the insiders said, because y'all have made him too controversial for us to mess with. So there's a method in continuing to go. And this is our ninth week. And uh, I think I've only missed two. I was in Brooklyn this week at Downstate. They're trying to close Downstate Medical Center. And they had the rally at the same time and they asked me to come speak. And somebody called and said, well, Ray Mal ain't going to Brooklyn and do nothing that small. So I said, that's exactly where I'm going. So I went and, and joined. They had a couple of thousand of us. There is no medical services in central Brooklyn other than Downstate Hospital. And I wanted to go to urge not only the state, but the federal government to do whatever they need to do to keep downstate open. We can find emergency money for everything. We need to find emergency money for downstate. And I wanted to be there uh, with them and uh, that's why I wasn't there. But, but let me say the DEI marches will continue every, every Thursday at 12 noon, 12 to 1. And I'll be there this Thursday. DEI, where we are, let me tell you that a lot of people miss. You are not responsible, Reverend Green, for what folks did unless you are going to do something in your time. I'm tired of preachers that are experts on what God did. Like God can't still do something now. Our challenges are to fight what we face right now. It's great to know black history, but it's greater to make some. Don't tell me how great our people was and you're not involved in nothing now. The challenges today are that they have this in the last year. They have turned back many of the things that were gained in the 60s. Our fight is to regain what was lost and sustain a forward movement. University of Florida just closed this entire DEI pro, uh, program. Fired the director. I'm talking about this week. Fired the director and fired 13 employees this week. Governor DeSantis and others have challenged that they're going to, con to completely wipe out diversity programs in Florida. This is after he banned books. So don't be an expert on the 60s and you living in 2024 and you're not active about doing something right now. Oh, Dr. King was a great man. Oh, Malcolm was a great man. All right, and what are you going to do about it? I spent, last Sunday night, I went to London, England and spent two days and spoke at Oxford 
University. It's the third time they had me at Oxford Union and Cambridge Union. But the main thing we did in the trip, I brought Ashley with me because I wanted her to see how international this struggle is. A lot of the people there joining National Action Network. And the main thing is 50 ministers, 50 pastors stood with me at the House of Lords and announced their goal, they're going to register 100 black Britons in, this, in the nation of the United Kingdom because they have an election there just like we have one here. And they have a member of the parliament that had disparaged them and Muslims. And they was offended by it. So this is what incited their drive toward a million person registration drive. Now I was invited over there by those that work with us in Nash Action Network 32, 33 years ago in 1991, they killed a young man called Roland Adams. And Roland Adams was a young black man in London, went in a neighborhood that they did not want blacks in. And a white mob chased him and killed him. Some young activists there heard about what we did here in Howard Beach and Bensonhurst and asked me would I come over and lead the march for Roland Adams. And I flew over and uh, went to, uh, it, it, it was interesting, on the flight over, a guy uh, was sitting uh, near me, came over and sat next to me and said he was uh, a reporter and wanted to interview me. And you know, I'm sitting up there, I'm in first class. You know, I don't fly the back of nothing on a Rosa Parks. I always go first class. <laughs> So he sat next to me, said he wanted to talk to me. And he interviewed me halfway across the Atlantic. And when we landed, people that was with me gathered and we'd gone out. We saw he went on a sideway of customs. He didn't go through customs like all of us. Found out he was from Scotland Yard. And if I had said anything provocative on the plane, they were going to ban me from coming in the country. A member of parliament had made a motion to have me banned. And they voted it down, but they wanted Scotland Yard to investigate my coming in. Was I going to incite something? I said, wait a minute, incite what? Y'all done kill somebody. Something has already happened. What are y'all looking to something? So these activists invited me, and I led the march, and it was similar to Bensonhurst. They waved bananas at us, called us monkeys in London. I ain't never been called the N-word with a British accent till that day. <laughs> but those people organized. It was interesting because 91 was the same year we started NAN. So we were here organizing and they organized. And as time went on, they gained political power in England. And the person that invited us over this week is now a member of the House of Lords, Sir Simon Woolley. And Roland Adam, the victim who was killed, his aunt is a member of the House of the Lord. Yeah. House of the Lord. So it's a matter of a struggle all over the diaspora if we all support one another. That's why I said I am absolutely outraged on what is going on in Gaza. I'm outraged you would have people killed being online for food. Just like I'm opposed to people killing innocent civilians in Israel would happen October 7th. I ain't got no partial morality. You wrong on either side to kill civilians. But at the same time, and I said this in England, nobody's talking about the ethnic wars killing thousands of black folks in Rwanda. 
and in Niger and in Chad right now. So while some in the Jewish community saying, Red Mal, are you standing with us? Or some in the Palestinian community, Red Mal, are you standing with us? Yes, but are you standing with us? Don't act like black lives don't matter. And the Saudis are arming people in Rwanda around them ethnic wars. I've been to Rwanda. I've been to Sudan. And we cannot be ones that just react to the news. We need to make the news. That's why when we have our convention every year and people are signing up, and this year is April 10th through the 13th, uh, uh, Robert Smith, black being there, arguably the richest black in the country, is going to head our economic forum like he did last year. A lot of big names are coming, but I don't want y'all to come just for the big names. We have workshops and deal with content and a strategy. We came out of last year and built all the way through the March on Washington, all the way through dealing with DEI and dealing on the ground. Vice President spoke last year. She probably be there building himself this year. All of it free. Y'all that are watching us, you need to register. Why register? Because we do the amount of space, the ballrooms that we choose based on what is registered. So don't have me registering for 200 room, person that a uh, room for 200, and 500 of y'all showed up, didn't register. And then be talking about where's your seat? Outside on 7th Avenue, that's where your seat is. So register right now, www.nationalactionnetwork.net, www.nationalactionnetwork.net, and be with us. If you can't do all three days, do one day. Do a half day, but register. But let, let me bring it back. We're going to have everything from health care to media to every, everything. Uh, we do our women's luncheon is always a, a key part, and our black church. One of the things that I'm very proud of this organization, we've had everything and everybody that is of significance come across our conventions and our platform. I was telling some of the young folk here the other day, on this little stage, We've had everybody from Barack Obama to Hillary Clinton, you name them. Because my concept was that we are tired of us having to chase folk. Let them come to us. You want our votes, you come to us. You want our consumer dollar, you come to us. You got to teach people how to respect us. You, that's why when y'all see me, when people want ask me to run to uh, support them, they running for something, I take them to Sylvia's. Sit up in the window and make the photographers take the picture. Because just, just the visual of that teaches our children that they ought to be respected. I can meet with them downtown. I got office downtown. I got an office in 30 Rock, but that doesn't give a signal. I want my grandson to know that folk that want something from you need to come to you, and you need to have an agenda just like they have an agenda. I remember years ago when we first started rising up, and Ed Koch was mayor. And Koch said to me, every time I meet with you, you got a list. I said, that's right. I'm not here for no photo op. He used to meet with black leaders that was glad to be in the meeting. Anytime you meet with someone with power and they are glad to meet with you, you did not have a good meeting. You want folk to say, man, I hope I don't have got to see him again. You're not in the room to make them comfortable. You're in the room to push the envelope because they didn't invite you in the room. You earned your way in the room. Yeah. 
Tomorrow is the 69th, the uh, 59th observation of the march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. And we'll be there, I go every year. And I'll be marching across that bridge tomorrow with Vice President Kamala Harris. We talked this week on the phone a long time. And let me, let, me, let me tell you why I raised that. First of all, this is Women History Month. There was a woman named Amelia Boykin. Yes. Yes. A lot of folks don't talk about Miss Boykin. I wrote about in my last book, Righteous Troublemakers, Kathleen's favorite book. <laughs> she reads after she turned off her favorite television show, Politics Nation, with Al Shop. <laughs> and Amelia Boykin was a black woman in Selma that there was in a town near Selma called Marion, Alabama where there was these drives to get blacks the right to vote. I want y'all to get this. They came one night, the law enforcement, and raided the rally and killed a young man who had ran with his grandmother to another place, shot, killed him named Jimmy Lee Jackson. It was that tragedy that incited Amelia Boykin asked Martin Luther King and others to come to Selma and fight to get them the right to vote in the name of Jimmy Lee. Okay. Dr. King came and brought his staff. Now, I want y'all to get this because a lot of y'all that do not understand histories of movements don't think that everything that's going on is new. You had Dr. King and SCLC there. You had CORD there, Congress of Racial Equality, which was a major civil rights group at that time. You had SNCC, which was the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, was the young, younger crowd. All of them debating on how they were going to do Selma. SNCC saying that the old God need to back up and let us go. That, that, ain't, that didn't just start with you. There always been this conflict. Right, right. Old God versus young God, nonviolence versus self-defense. And there was these internal tensions. Mm -hmm. Dr. King used to say, the answer is not the thesis or the antithesis, it's the synthesis. Mm -hmm. And they say that he was always one that wanted to hear all sides of a story, all sides of a debate, all sides of a conflict. And then he would bring together where there'd be common ground. In the middle of them beginning to strategize and fight, then they decided they were going to march from Selma to Montgomery. Why? Because Amelia Boykin lived in Selma, had a local organized group there. And they were going to march to Montgomery, which was the capital of Alabama. Mm -hmm. All right? And they were marching for the right to vote. Now, John Lewis was the head of SNCC. Reverend Hosea Williams was the deputy for Dr. King assigned to the Selma march. And they decided to get the march going, they were gonna march from Selma over the Edmund Pettus Bridge and march certain miles a day and take 10 days and end up in, in uh, Montgomery. Now, they got ready to march. Some of the students in SNCC mm -hmm. said, we don't need to be marching behind these preachers. We need a new God. They debated all the way. When they got out there on the bridge, the state troopers said, you're going no further. And they kept marching. John Lewis, Jose Williams up front, Amelia Boykin, who had hosted them. And, and when I say hosted them, I mean hosted them. When Dr. King would come and stay in Selma, 
he lived in her house because it was segregation. They couldn't stay in the hotel. This is, this is uh, 65. They had just got the uh, public accommodations bill the, the year before. But it like Juneteenth, it took time to desegregate everywhere. They got to the top of the bridge and the troopers stormed them and tear gassed them and beat John Lewis and Jose Williams and tear gassed Amelia Boykin and forced them back to the church. Dr. King was not there. He was in Atlanta at his home church. Heard about it and they drove the two hours to Selma that night, met, went through all the debates and decided to continue the march. It was the visuals of the beating on the bridge that made Lyndon Johnson and the Congress say, we got to do something about voting. That's why when people tell y'all, well, y'all always react when something happened, it has always been the visuals that become the impetus for movements to gain their momentum. You can talk policy all day long, but if people see it, then they understand what you're talking about. We've been fighting policing 30 years, but when they saw George Floyd, everybody around the world reacted, and all of a sudden we wasn't crazy. And you know how folk in power are. They ain't never going to admit they were wrong. They talk about, well, Reverend Al has matured. I'm saying the same thing now I was saying then. But now they couldn't hide it because a young black girl put it on video. Reason why we have a state law named after Eric Garner is somebody put it on video. The beating on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, when, what at that time would have been viral, when not network news. Dr. King and Andy Young, many of y'all remember Andy Young was at our convention last year, told the story that Johnson had told them, I got you the Civil Rights Act, that's all I can do. I can't go back to Congress for nothing else. And Dr. King said to, uh, Andy Young, well, I guess we're going to have to go back down south and stir things up and give the president some power. He said, I ain't got the power. Johnson told him, I ain't got the power to do this. I already done one. And they said, we're going south and give him some power. The power came from the beating on the Selma Bridge. And Dr. King and them then continued to march 10 days until they got to Montgomery. And that led to the Voting Rights Act because of the embarrassment, shame, and disgrace of what they did on that bridge. I say all that to say that I say all that to say that we did not get voting rights or voter protection because somebody donated it. We fought to get the right That's to vote. Right. That's right. That's right. That's right. The last time John Lewis was on that bridge, right before he died, y'all seen the pictures, we had to hold him up. And he said, I left some blood on this bridge. Medgar Evers was killed two months before the March on Washington 63 for doing voter registration in Mississippi. So when this court, present court, took out section two of the Voting Rights Act, it was a smack in the face to all of us that had to fight to get the right to vote in the first place. So you sitting around, I hope some of these black men talking about Trump, you sitting around talking about, well, I, I, I just like Trump's swagger. Well, let me tell you what his swagger did. He put three people on the Supreme Court. They already had two staunch 
conservatives on the court. Those three plus the two, five to four, snatched the gut out of the Voting Rights Act. That's right. Those five ended affirmative action, which led to the fight against DEI. Everything that we gained in the civil rights movement of the 60s has been neutralized or overturned by Trump's Supreme Court. Yeah. Trump stood up in broad daylight and said that black folks relate to him because of a mugshot. Because all of y'all are crooks and criminals anyway. That's what he's saying. I was, when I attacked that last week on my show, guy stopped me and said, Re Reverend Al, that, that, you know, I didn't see that as racist. I said, okay. If Barack Obama had said that he had a mugshot and Italians or Jews or Irish loved him because of the mugshot, would you have been offended? He said, nah, I get your point. Nobody would have been allowed to say that about anybody other than us. And why would we sit there and allow somebody to say that about us? We're not criminals, yes. Many of us have had our battles with the criminal justice system. Some of them were wrongly charged. We have been disproportionately arrested and convicted. But we don't celebrate a mugshot we shouldn't have got. Yes, that's right. Well, they, uh, this Trump, uh, well, they relate to me because they feel I'm being persecuted. Like they feel they were. Feel they were. Well, let me tell you, when we was persecuted, Mr. Trump, when we were trying to get apartments and buildings and you and your daddy owned, and you would not rent to blacks. That's when we was persecuted. When five young men were scooped up one night in Central Park and accused of a vicious raping of a white woman in Central Park and you took ads out while we stood up for them, you took advertisements out and said that they should face the death penalty. That's when we were persecuted. Five innocent young men, some of them went to jail. One went 13 years in jail for a crime he didn't commit. And that you said that ain't enough, you should give him the death penalty. That's when we were persecuted. But that's why I like Rem Janice's sermon this morning. Even when we down, God will make a way. Because... Because the boy that did 13 years, Donald Trump, is in the House of Justice this morning. Stand up, Corey White. And he lived to see the same courthouse that they dragged him and his four partners in. He lived to see them bring you in and indict you and charge you. Same courthouse in lower Manhattan that a black man named Alvin Bragg is going to try you at the end of May. Same courthouse. You never thought that a black man, Alvin Bragg in Manhattan, and a black woman in Fulton County, Georgia, Fannie Willis. And a black woman out of Brooklyn, Tish James, would be able to bring you down the halls of justice. But the reason they can do it is because we bled on the Edmund Pettus Bridge and we got a right to vote and we put our folk in power. We are not your slaves no more.
Bring me right back to the Bible. That's why I tell preachers that tell me when I go to preach somewhere, remember I'll just stay in the book. That's exactly what I stay in. They want me to only preach the hallelujah shout. And ain't nothing wrong with the hallelujah shout, but there's a lot more in the Bible than that. There was a story in the Bible of a people that were being rolled toward genocide, moved toward genocide. They were going to be destroyed. One of the reasons was there was a man with power in the government that did not like the Jews of that time. He was irritated with an activist called Mordecai. And he decided he wanted to kill all the Jews. And he had a plan of genocide to wipe out all the Jews. But even the king, who went along with the plan, the king still had a loving of women. I don't care who you are, you're going to do some things in life. Mm -hmm. And right. attraction is one of them. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And he ended up bringing into his court mm -hmm. and married several women. One of them, Mordecai's niece. Mm -hmm. yes. They didn't know that it Mordecai's niece. She never told nobody who she was. She just moved and did what was happening. But soon she found out about this plan that Haman had to kill her people. Now some of y'all get up in these legislative halls, get up in Congress, get up in the assembly, get up in wherever, and see the plans against your people. And don't open your mouth. Don't say a word. But Esther couldn't hold her peace. And Esther sent word to her uncle, Mordecai, saying that there's a plan to kill our people. Haman has laid out the plan. The king has signed off on it. They're going to kill our people. And Mordecai sent word back saying, you got to go to the king. She said, I can't go to the king. Protocol in the palace is you can't go to the king unless he sends for you. Mordecai sent word back, you don't have time for protocol. You don't have time to go through what's normal. Just go in there, interrupt protocol, and save your people. She thought about it. She sent word back. Mm -hmm. Watch this. She didn't say I'm going to have a strategy meeting. Mm -hmm. She didn't say I'm going to get the coalition together. Yeah. She said I'm going to fast three days oh, and three nights. Oh, right. And then I'm going to see the king. Oh, yeah. And if I perish, oh, yeah. if I perish, oh, yeah. if I perish, oh, yeah. I perish. Oh, yeah. But I'm going. Yeah to see the king and when she went to see the king God went with her and what Haman had planned for the Israelites happened to Haman I come to tell you on Women History Month if you stand up God will back you up if you have the faith he has the power you got to have that if I perish attitude I'm going to put it on the line. For God, I live. For God, I die. Stand up, black woman. Stand up, black woman. Be Esther. Stand up, black man. Stand up with courage. Stand up with strength. I walked. I walked around Oxford. University on Monday. And I showed my daughter Ashley. They had pictures going back to the 1800s. All the great minds. 
spoke at Oxford. Had one picture they showed Ashley of Albert Einstein speaking in the same hall I was speaking in. Only a few blacks. James Baldwin, Malcolm X have been to Oxford. And I'm sitting there talking to the students at Oxford as I did the day before in Cambridge. And the odds are one of them may one day be the Prime Minister of England. And as you go through the House of Lords, same thing, photos going back to the 1700s. I don't have that lineage. I just learned my great-grandfather's slavery not long ago. I said, but the reason I can stand up and talk to these kids that go back with centuries of lineage is I come from another kind of lineage. And if y'all want to check my lineage, it's in a hymn my mama used to like. And maybe she didn't know it, but she was giving me a grounding and a rooting that those I would speak to later in life, they had theirs from their forefathers. But I didn't have forefathers to have that grounding and rooting, Kathleen. All I had was a hymn saying, Blessed Assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a forte of glory divine. Nobody left me nothing, but I'm an heir. Nobody willed me nothing, but I'm an heir. Nobody put me in there, put me in their will or in their state, but I'm not left with nothing. I'm an heir of salvation. I've been purchased of God. I was born of his spirit I've been washed in his blood this is I don't know what you read in the Esquire but this is my story this is my song praising 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 my savior all the day long blessed assurance is mine oh what a foretaste of glory divine I'm an heir of salvation I've been purchased by God Everybody's singing. Everybody's singing. Everybody's singing. Everybody's singing. Everybody's singing. 
everybody sang. Everybody sang. Everybody sang. Sang it like you mean it. Sang it like you mean it. Sing it like you mean it. I'm open the doors of the movement. There may be someone here today that's not a member of National Action Network. You hear us on the radio, you watch some of our activities on television, but you never join National Action Network. If you're here today, Today is your day to join and become a member. I don't care if you have the membership dues today or not. Just come on down to me and let us sign you up right now on this first Saturday of Women's History Month and become a member of National Action Network. Come on. Everybody singing. Come on. Everybody sing. Everybody singing. Sing it like you mean it. Sing it like you mean it. Sing it like you mean it. One more time, y'all. One more time, y'all. Everybody sing. Everybody singing. Everybody sing. Everybody singing. Everybody singing. Everybody sing. Everybody singing. One last time, y'all. One last time, y'all. One last time, y'all. All right. We are going to raise our offering. Glad many of you out, even in the rain. We have, give me one of those positive communities. Uh, uh, they're at the door, they're at the door. I meant to say this on the air. This uh, black church based journal, Positive Community, we have some in the back, gave a cover story on Nan and its social justice issue. And of course, some of you know that uh, they got a large profile in Esquire. I can tell which members read white media because y'all told me about Esquire. Y'all are the blacker than black, didn't know nothing about it. So I'll leave that alone. All right. But I. Appreciate Positive Community that gave us an award last week. We don't have enough to give everybody, so y'all don't be walking around showing them. Just people that want them will get them. Thank you. Carmella, who does our dances, they got a big photo of her in the Esquire. She's one of the, uh, you know, she's one of the original Soul Train dancers. Some of y'all too young to even know what Soul Train was. I told somebody in, in, uh, in our youth department, that you, you know, she's one of the Soul Train dancers. And they said, what's Soul Train?
That, that puts it in your place, right? All right, let's get ready to raise our offering. It's right at 11. I want to raise our offering, taking the new members and let you go. We said 9, 9 to 11, and I want to be faithful to that. Watch the show 5 o'clock today and then going on to Selma tomorrow. I'm going to do the show from Selma tomorrow with some of the leaders after we march over the bridge with our vice president. I need about 10 folks, about 10. Don't embarrass me. We got company. Don't. Don't have Janice and Kathleen talk about me. I need 10 people. Give me $100 or more. Come quickly. Winston Gilchrist, $100.